our new state of the arts um, archives that we are building here in Washington, D.C. at the beautiful, on the beautiful campus of the University of the District of Columbia. So thank you again for joining. This is one of first of many sessions um, that we will have on um, the design of this beautiful facility. And I want to thank Dr. Lopez for all of his hard work. I'd also like to thank other members of my staff, as well as um, DGS and our architects, Hartman and Cox. Um, there's a lot of people working on this, and we want it to be very successful. Mayor Bowser wants it to be very successful. And so thank you so much again for attending. Um, we look forward to any input that you have. And um, this is going to be a, a really transparent process. And we are glad that you are here, that you're involved, that you're engaged in making sure that DC's history is preserved um, in the way that it should be. So thank you again. And um, I'm going to send it back over to Dr. Lopez. Thank you uh, so much, Secretary Bassett. And um, as uh, she said, we are in the process of designing our new state archives. I do want to let you know that we are recording this session and so we will share it online. Um, so just so you're aware, um, I'd now like to introduce our team from Hartman Cox, uh, Scott Texera, who is on the line. So welcome, Scott. And I will let you kind of tell us where you want to go. Sure. Sure. Uh, can everyone hear me OK? All right. And then, um, Dr. Matthews, if you could keep an eye out for a guest named uh, Dunstan McCauley. He's our mechanical engineer. I invited him late. And uh, if you notice him sign on, if you could uh, move him up into the presenter category so that he's able to speak. So anyway, um, I wanted to uh, thank the secretary and the administrator for this uh, opportunity. Um, to interact with the public and to present uh, our early work on the design of this project. Um, I, I, I see some familiar names here in the group of attendees, and uh, I know that many of uh, the members of the public that are interested in this project um, are themselves, you know, seasoned uh, researchers or professional researchers, and, and um, you bring a lot of insights uh, into um, the conversation. Um, you know, from, from that perspective, and I, I value that. Um, let's see. So, uh, as many of you may already know, uh, Hartman Cox has had a deep involvement uh, with this uh, project. We're partnered uh, with um, an associated architecture firm in town, uh, EYP Architecture, which in recent uh, in the recent year or so um, has become Page Sutherland Page, and now Page Architects. So, uh, they are. Uh, uh, part of the team helping with the archival storage environment, storage uh, facilities, storage equipment layouts, processing layouts, and so forth. Um, uh, our two firms sort of share that expertise, but that's their role. And and we're also uh, being guided um, by Mich Michelle Pacifico, who's uh, a consulting archivist specializing in the planning and uh, design of uh, archival facilities. So. Um, our work began, I think, back in 2015 um, on the heels of some earlier studies uh, by others. Uh, and we uh, uh, began our work with a, a programmatic, a preliminary program study um, and uh, with recommendations about the size of the building and its uh, special characteristics. And, and uh, that matriculated into a series of uh, site evaluation studies um, with various recommendations. And then um, an opportunity came up in 2018 to consider uh, uh, this site at the University of the District of Columbia's Van Ness campus. Uh, so uh, in, in 2018, 2017 and 18, uh, we worked on a co-location analysis and study, feasibility study. Um, and and so this current project is really an outgrowth of the recommendations from that report. Um, and, uh, and, and it sort of begins with acknowledging the suitability of, of, of Building 41. Building 41, uh, which is uh, currently sits on the site of this project, uh, is, is uh, uh, the largest of, of the campus's original buildings, and it occupies a, a central and somewhat dominant location on the campus. Um, 
uh, it's a building that uh, has long been recognized as neat, is in a sort of dire need of of, of a complete modernization and, and uh, renovation if it were to be reused. Um, we studied the feasibility of that uh, and and um, uh, un what unsurprising for us because we do a lot of these studies, but but maybe of some surprise to others is that uh, the existing building really is not suitable to be repurposed for this type of facility. Uh, it's floor to floor heights aren't um, really suitable for the large volumes of uh, uh, storage uh, equipment, the ranges of, of, of storage systems that are needed um, uh, to accommodate OPR's program. Um, the strength of the building, it's, it was designed to be an academic building, even, even though it was a library, it's, it, it, it was a library with uh, ordinary sort of fixed shelving, which is an extremely low density uh, uh, storage uh, solution, uh, which doesn't require a lot of strength and, and the, the storage densities that, that are needed for this type of facility are, are vastly, uh, more dense and, uh, heavier. And so, uh, it just really wasn't practical to try to undertake the structural strengthening that would be needed. Uh, and then just the inherent geometry of the building, it's octagonal shape. It has many, many triangular, uh, uh spaces and, um, uh, which, which just don't really uh, uh, work very well for uh, compact mobile storage systems, which which uh, work out much better in sort of rectangular spaces. So um, our our co-location study uh, recommended that the building be uh, replaced with a new purpose-built facility, and that's that's what we've designed. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on my screen and. Um, uh, let's see if this works. Um, I don't know, Dr. Matthews. Can you turn on your mic and tell me if if you see the visual yep. on your end? Okay, it's great. All right. So, um, oh, also just a, a summary outline of what to expect today. Uh, 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 the uh, my portion of the presentation here has been planned to consume about maybe twenty five minutes or so. Um, with the intent being that really the bulk of the time that's been allocated for this um, en encounter today uh, can be devoted to questions and answers and and, and so forth. Um, and uh, so just to let everyone know that that's what they can expect. And now let me see if I can get this thing to toggle. All right. Um, and so apologies, you know, some some of this information uh, may already be familiar to, to some or many of you, but um, uh, I'm mindful of the fact that there may be uh, attendees today that uh, haven't had a chance to see any information. So I'm basically going to tell the whole story. So uh, uh, this this image here is a aerial view of of the UDC uh, Van Ness campus uh, building 41. I hope people can sort of see my my cursor flying around. Is this is this building right here? And this is this is Van Ness Street. This is a view sort of looking north and the, the diagonal avenue here is Connecticut. Um, and uh, uh, noteworthy elements of the campus that uh, surround the site are, are the uh, Denard Plaza, which is the large uh, central sort of university yard and open space here. And um, there are some athletic fields on the west side. The north field is currently under construction uh, and the southern field um, is planned uh, uh, for sort of um, a variety of of, of uh, less formal but active recreation functions uh, here, um, and there's a service road that had been constructed to support the uh, temporary elementary school that was here several years ago, and and that is a summary of the existing conditions. Um, this diagram is meant to um, highlight and emphasize the primary sort of circulation patterns that exist. Uh, most of uh, the campus visitors, um, well, I don't know if it's most, but um, a significant portion arrive uh, by, by metro, um, either from the bus depot or from the metro rail station. And uh, they enter the campus through the recently completed uh, student center and uh, up onto the plaza level. And building 41 has a uh, sort of what we call an architecture as a passage, but it has a a covered pass-through walkway through it um, uh, 
to Van Ness here making a connection. And then there are other campus connections that flow around in the opposite direction of um, in addition to public transit, uh, the campus is served by a garage structure that sits beneath th this plaza and beneath uh, these buildings, uh, buildings 38, 39, 44, and building 41 all sit on top of this uh, uh, two and a half level garage. Um, it's uh, accessed uh, primarily from Van Ness uh, in an entry port that passes sort of beneath an open air breezeway of building 44 and down. Um, there's also an exit only ramp uh, that runs across the frontage of our site um, exiting over in this location. And there's an auxiliary sort of service entry level uh, from within the interior of the campus down at the lowest level, um, uh, which uh, might be available for all users, but I think it's you know primarily, I think staff and administration and so forth uh, utilize that level. And this is uh, uh, the same site plan, but now with our proposed footprint uh, placed on it, uh, replacing building 41. Uh, uh, some of the circulation patterns are adjusted, but uh, our idea here is that uh, we would be removing what we see as a lot of barriers uh, between the campus and Van Ness in this area. Uh, building 41 has sort of a split level mechanical room uh, in this area. I'll go back to show that this this sort of structure here and then the ramp. All of these things collectively sort of make it very disconnected between the plaza and the street. Um, and then the only connection is out here, which also is is sort of a unpleasant, uh, at least in terms of uh, you know pedestrian experience uh, in our estimation. Um, and so we're trying to um, uh, establish a new sort of primary pedestrian connection here with some plaza improvements uh, in this area. And then other flow is the same. Um, this illustration uh, depicts the future planned uh, improvement to uh, by UDC for this uh, southern field site. Uh, our understanding is that the desire, their desire is to uh, construct a 200 meter uh, four lane running track at this location. And um, and so we have aligned our service road and, and service entrances to the building to sort of coordinate with those desires and to make sure that there's enough uh, land area available for them to um, implement those plans. Uh, and um, the other noteworthy thing to point out here is that ramp coming from the garage, that exit only ramp we are proposing that it be removed. Uh, part of the impetus for this is the university's uh, recently updated master plan, uh, which in the section of the master plan devoted to uh, uh, Department of Transportation goals and recommendations, uh, it was identified as a as a goal to, um, to remove this ramp. It's difficult to maintain. It's uh, um, and uh, and it, it it also sort of complicates some of the uh, internal uh, traffic patterns. So um, here is. Uh, a, a 3D sort of digital campus rendering uh, showing the existing Denard Plaza and the surrounds student centers here. This is Van Ness and here is our proposed uh, facility. And um, here's a view uh, from the opposite angle of the existing building here. You get a better sense of a lot of those sort of ground plane uh, uh, features that uh, sort of obstruct the connection of the plaza to the street. And um, that same view uh, with our facility dropped in. Um, and here's uh, an early sketch that we can share from the landscape architects on, on, on the ideas for how to treat the uh, site elements and site work around the building. Um, again, here, the, the, the cream colored spaces are, are sort of paved uh, pedestrian areas and um, uh, this area here is uh, proposed to be sort of a sunken open space uh, uh, of general purpose. I mean, the landscape architects are contemplating some sort of stage element. We're working with uh, UDC and their their sort of student uh, student life uh, representatives and and so forth on on um, on 
on the you know usefulness of some of these ideas. Uh, uh, the sculpture and water feature that anchor the west end of the plaza, we're uh, proposing that those uh, remain as they are. Um, we're going to sort of uh, uh, we're proposing some alterations to the edges, the planted edges of that area to uh, accomplish sort of a transition between this sort of formal central geometry and, and some of the undulating uh, 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 pathways that we're proposing uh, here. Um, some uh, landscape buffers uh, between these pathways in the building. And then the, the pale green areas are stormwater. Uh, uh, you know, they're planted bioretention facilities, but they're intended to address um, the cities and the uh, US EPA's regulations for stormwater management. Um, let's see. This uh, exhibit here uh, just presents a review of the types of site amenities, uh, 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 just just generally of um, of the uh, from the landscape architects for how uh, site walls and and seating areas can be integrated. Uh, uh, you know the the terracing of of some of the uh, open spaces and gathering spaces, and the way that some of the planted areas can be bermed and planted. Uh, to provide, uh, you know, some some screening and buffering of adjacent functions and so forth. Um, I'm going to shift here to uh, a summary review of the building's organization and plan. Um, the uh, spaces here have been color coded, uh, but I can walk through it. The uh, this is the the entrance level or the plaza level of the building. Um, uh, we're proposing a, a single primary entrance for the entire facility. This is guided by OPR's request uh, 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 and is responding to the importance of uh, having a single sort of security checkpoint for all users, visitors, staff alike. Um, uh, so all persons entering this building would pass. Uh, they would either arrive from the garage levels through uh, this garage elevator shuttle or stairs that come from the lower garage levels. They'd come in. Uh, people coming in off the street would come in. They go through security screening and into this open uh, this lobby space, which sort of serves as a pre-function or ante room uh, to some of the other lobbies. Um, when you come in, uh, these bright orange spaces are are, are public um, spaces. This is uh, proposed to be an uh, exhibition gallery, uh, and. And one of the other program uh, developments uh, when we re when we worked uh, to update the program earlier this year was uh, the city's interest in in having a more robust meeting facility here that can not only support uh, OPR's uh, programs and needs but also uh, can uh, support other meetings and events of the DC government and um, and and also you know uh, UDC. Um, uh, uh, pr programs as well, uh, especially those that sort of synergize with, uh, you know, education and history and and so forth. Uh, the striped areas are circulation lobby zones that are uh, public access. Um, the blue areas are the research facility, the research room. So there's um, uh, this is proposed uh, uh, up in this portion of the building. It it. Uh, um, is faced uh, with a window wall or a glazed uh, window wall um, and uh, addresses the plaza and, and basically and, and and I'll be able to explain some of this when we get back to the the renderings and the massing views. But uh, uh, the, the the project's program is so heavy with the collection storage areas, which uh, should not have any natural daylight. You know, there's a lot of solid blank walls. And so. Uh, uh, we're trying to highlight sort of the people spaces uh, with uh, glass walls and in the building. The building sort of expresses its program, you know, form and function uh, with that uh, uh, contrast between the solid and the glassy interiors. And I, I meant to sort of mention some of that in the early visuals of, of the building's uh, current massing design, but um, that's picked up here in the plans as well. Um, the uh, as is common for a facility of this type, we have separate uh, service facilities for uh, collections loading or, or records loading, which we sort of call this like the clean dock, and then a dirty dock here for building services and waste and so forth, um, both serviced from the same service apron here on the west side. 
and um, uh, some ventilation uh, uh, area ways uh, for the garage. These are existing to remain, actually. Um, and then a variety of uh, support spaces, uh, mechanical rooms, uh, uh, quarantine spaces, intake spaces uh, for collections intake, um, uh, an exhibit support uh, space uh, to support exhibitions. Also, not only are is, is uh, exhibit elements are not only are exhibit elements planned for the gallery, but they're also planned uh, to be other sort of freestanding displays uh, out in the lobby areas as well. Uh, and then other support spaces for uh, the, like chair storage, table storage and so forth for the for the uh, meeting facilities. Um, when we get up into the upper levels, these are, are non-public levels. The uh, uh, TAN uh, spaces are either um, office or, or processing areas, but these are sort of uh, people spaces or sometimes people and collections uh, spaces in the case of the processing rooms. Um, the purple areas are uh, our first pass at um, uh, the arrangement of spaces for uh, the the university's uh, archival staff. Um, this this building is proposed uh, to accommodate um, not only OPR's collections, uh, which is the vast majority of the collections volume that have to be stored in this building, but but also um, uh, two collections that are uh, uh, belonging to the university. One of those is the uh, Felix E. Jazz archives, and then the other is uh, the university's own archives. And um, so office space here, processing space here, and the nature of those collections, at least with the jazz archives, uh, we've arranged these spaces on the second floor at the moment, um, uh, because this is also where uh, the cool storage areas are are planned, um, which have a slightly colder uh, environment, more appropriate for the types of media that are in uh, the jazz archives collection. And um, and so that that sort of proximity or adjacency was was something we were striving for. Um, the dark green areas are textual storage, um, and the lighter green are are the cool storage for non-textual media. Uh, so works of uh, you know framed objects or frame or or artworks or framed objects up on these art screens in this area. Um, large sort of of, of uh, stationary racks for uh, 3D objects, uh, of which there are several in the collection. Um, uh, we have uh, upright freezers for cold storage, and, um, and we're in discussion with uh, OPR right now about uh, providing um, a larger environmental chamber for, uh, 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 I guess, cooler storage. So this would be between cold and cool. Uh, at 50 degrees uh, for um, uh, uh, for for certain media that that uh, uh, are best preserved in that colder environment. Um, and let's see. Oh, the other uh, the other feature of the building that's not very common, but uh, uh, to help uh, buffer these uh, specialized environments from direct adjacency to the exterior. We, we have uh, these utility spaces. Uh, sometimes they're an, an egress corridor, but other times they're, they're really just a utility space. And uh, this, this offers not only that advantage, but also um, it gives us a place to run uh, stormwater lines from the roof and so forth uh, to make sure there's no water containing systems at all other than the fire suppression systems. Uh, in these uh, storage areas. Um, also, one of the lessons learned from people that have built these facilities is that sometimes when you have trouble with your exterior wall, um, if if your collection storage space is adjacent to the exterior wall, it can be a big deal to try to repair that wall. And so th this, uh, this idea makes, it sort of decouples the exterior wall from the storage environment. And, um, and uh, let's see, so I wanted to point that out. Um, then on the third floor, again, more uh, storage area. And I, I think the darkest shade green here is the uh, spaces that are for the DC Record Center. Um, and, uh, uh, and more office and support space. That's it, and then, and then the roof, we've got, uh, uh, 
some uh, equipment on the roof, but always positioned uh, uh, to be not above collections uh, storage areas. Um, earlier designs had a had a penthouse on the roof that has uh, changed uh, to this equipment screen and also uh, as much equipment as we could possibly relocate down to this lower western roof we have moved down here this was um, a comment that we had got from um, one of the reviewers uh, of the concept submission which was published a few months ago and um, uh, and then uh, space up on the roof reserved uh, for uh, PV arrays for on-site renewable energy and uh, and then here on to the uh, Below plaza levels of uh, the garage levels, the footprint of the new building is this dashed line. Uh, OPR we're proposing uh, has um, this last this last aisle of parking on the B1 level uh, would be reserved and controlled access for OPR vehicles and basically government vehicles. This is not public parking. Uh, uh, visitors to this facility that might be arriving in their own personal vehicle would use the garage as a general university visitor, uh, just like any other university uh, visitor would use. Um, uh, but uh, so this blue area is, is uh, reserved for uh, DC government vehicles. Uh, earlier plans had shown a separate ramp uh, uh, with direct access to this B1 level. Uh, that has gone away with the decision, which I did not point out, but actually uh, one of the big changes from concept design is we have uh, actually relocated the entire building 30 feet to the east. Uh, part of that was to ensure uh, that we weren't making any encroachments on the uh, uh, athletic field. Um, and then uh, uh, it also uh, helps uh, uh, reutilize a lot of the existing structure in this area that otherwise would have had to be uh, reconstructed. Um, and so that is, uh, I think, of a benefit to the project. And um, and uh, and so that ramp has gone away, and and the existing ramp here would remain. So visitors parking in this level would use the same approach path as they currently do. Uh, this is down at the lowest level. The shuttle stair, the the uh, new stair and shuttle elevator uh, serve both levels. Um, areas also here are set aside for uh, covered parking, bicycle parking. And um, and so now back to sort of the 3D uh, early visualizations. And um, so you can see that expression of solid and glass. So these are sort of the people areas, the office and staff support areas and lobby down here. Everything else is sort of collection storage. Uh, we are um, uh, emphasizing sort of the stair in that corner of the building as a way to help break up that facade. And, uh, and then here's some eye level uh, visualizations from Van Ness uh, looking um, uh, northwest uh, to uh, the streetscape of the new building, a closer view of that same sort of approach. Here's that sort of plaza into the campus um, beyond. Uh, we've also here offered uh, some early ideas of the types of facade treatments that we're contemplating with um, uh, fins, and this is to break up sort of the segmentation of the curved facades and also as a shading device. And um, uh, uh, the other material, the solid material, we are proposing uh, an architectural precast concrete that has uh, been formed and faced with um, a texture um, that can uh, basically uh, uh, change uh, throughout the day, you know, with the the light, uh, with the solar angles and shading and so forth. That, that the idea is that uh, that 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 this sort of responds to those changing lighting conditions as the sun moves throughout the sky uh, each day and through the seasons. And um, these are some views from uh, uh, the plaza. And uh, here is coming from the north end of the campus, walking south towards the plaza at the north end of, of the building. Uh, with two different concrete uh, colors are, are proposed, again, just to sort of break up the facades and to try to give them uh, uh, a little bit of uh, proportion relief and so forth. Uh, we're not locked in yet to any specific uh, texture or facade. These images sort of show the types of things that can be achieved. 
uh, scalloped or horizontal, but we are leaning towards this vertical striation that's uh, heavily expressed and, and board formed um, in appearance. Um, all of this sort of floating on on this uh, glass window wall in the areas that are non-collection storage. And um, with that, uh, Dr. Matthews, I, I, that's sort of the end of my prepared presentation, and we can switch it over to uh, people that may want to ask questions. All right, so I am going to, now I'm not as proficient with uh, Teams as I am with Zoom, so I'm going to go to, okay, so I believe I've given you all the ability. So if we have a question or comment or thought for discussion, if you could just raise your hand and we'll call on you. Kind of have a Gene, first guest. Yes. Can you turn on your camera? Oh, well, it's not allowing me to. Okay. You got it. Oh, where did you go? Oh, well, all righty. I guess Neil Flanagan, <laughs> you are on. Well, yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you. I, I, Microsoft decided my computer is a security threat, so I'm on my phone, so it's a little uh -oh. weird, a little close up. Um, we can see you. you know, Scott, I want to say uh, thank you for, for presenting this, and obviously, Lopez, thank you for hosting this. I hope this can be the beginning of um, a productive conversations that continue. I just, I am on the Archives Advisory Council, um, or Advisory Group, what it's called. Um, so I would just, I have a... Um, one question I, I'm curious about is that, you know, in, in the comments that the AAG provided, we asked, we suggested uh, exploration of um, acoustic effects on the uh, research room and considering relocation. Um, I noticed you didn't relocate it, uh, but you did add some landscape buffer and it, as you, even as you uh, reconfigured the plaza a little bit. So I'd be uh, interested in uh, why, uh, how you consider that and, and, and what your other considerations of acoustics and privacy are for the reading room. Yeah, uh, that's, um, that, I mean, that was a good comment and it, and it is a, a challenging issue. Um, uh, we uh, have uh, thought about, I mean, we studied options about swapping the location of the uh, meeting rooms and the, the research rooms. Um, I mean, there there's a variety of mitigating factors that we can uh, harness to try to manage uh, the acoustics. One is, uh, uh, which we did touch on today, which is the incorporation of uh, like a landscape buffer. Uh, there are uh, window wall systems that uh, uh, can be specified that uh, are more resistive in sound transmission that, that can help. Um, uh, window treatments can also help. Uh, uh, Dr. Matthews has pointed out that uh, uh, that uh, many of these issues can also be managed just through scheduling and planning. You know, the university's events calendar is published uh, uh, months and months ahead of time, and and most of uh, the researchers uh, that visit this facility will be coming by appointment, and so you can you can also sort of manage research sessions um, to coordinate with 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 programmed events in the plaza. Uh, the other issue is if we move the research center, you know, where would we move it to? The the other sort of obvious location is that southern frontage uh, to Van Ness, which then exposes it to road noise, which is actually more difficult to manage because that's uncontrolled. You know, when um, when activities in the roadway, emergency vehicles, or or traffic conditions might generate a whole other host of 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 uh, noise generating circumstances, and um, and so, yeah, it's 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 a difficult decision because, you know, the decision is sort of which function is the one that is better to get disrupted. You know, the meeting room with invited, which when it has a program, you know, would have lots and lots of uh, invited guests and a VAP speaker. You know, does that type of function be the function that you put in a space that would be subjected to the occasional acoustic interference or would it be the research room? Um, so we're still in deliberation with, uh, uh, I don't want to say deliberation, but you know, we're still in discussion with, with, uh, with Dr. Matthews on, on where OPR feels the best placement of that, of that space is. 
Um, so, I mean, that, that's the most I can say at the moment. I mean, we did we did uh, develop uh, sketch floor plans uh, to convince ourselves that uh, we can probably make the plan work with either function in either location. It's really just boils down to uh, you know where where we think it really works best, and and, um, and and the acoustic consideration isn't the only only consideration. You know, like the research room, you also want it to have a decent proximity to the you know its holding support and the the elevator and and uh, from the collections areas and so forth. And I know these distances aren't huge, and those things you know really might not dictate the decision, but there's a multitude of factors that come into play, and we're trying to balance all of them. Sure, understood. I mean, do you have do you have an acoustic consultant, right? Yes, yeah, we do. The uh, firm uh, Miller Beam, Paganelli, uh, Martin Beam. He's a, a, a seasoned acoustician, and and uh, uh, we actually shared your uh, uh, the uh, review comments from AAG with him, so he he understands the concern and uh, is is uh, intends to work with us closely when we start design development on uh, on what sorts of uh, strategies and and uh, surfaces and acoustic technologies we can use to diffuse and absorb uh, the sound energy um, in the right ways you know so, so he will be guiding a lot of the acoustic the decisions about acoustic treatments and so forth okay and the, the sort of side second question on that is also the light i was i'm a little concerned about uh east facing exposure you know i was spent a couple weeks ago i was at the as at nara 2 out in college park which is a great room as long as the sun is not like shining directly on your documents and yeah, I, I just I, I'm curious if you if you have any thoughts about uh, mitigation of glare uh, with an east facing exposure. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, a, a, again, uh, not 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 to sound dismissive, but we we did uh, uh, take that comment as an opportunity to to study the solar conditions in that room, um, uh, uh, discovering that that that. Uh, I think in the seating layout, just the eastern like 10 feet of that room had had direct sunlight uh, like in the early morning hours until like between 8 and 10 uh, or 8, 8 and 930. And then after 930, uh, the light is really just in the first five feet of the room. And and then after that, like by 1030 in the morning, uh, there's no direct light in the room. So, you know, OPR intends, I think, to operate from nine to four. Five is that right, Dr. Matthews? Yes. So, yeah. So we're really talking only about the first hour of the day where there would be some direct sunlight in the room. So it's not like it's, so. Our idea is that researchers that would prefer not to sit in the direct sunlight, you know, would have the tables that aren't in direct sunlight to choose from for for where to sit and 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 do their research. And then, of course, we can draw upon you know window treatments, window screens, roller shades, the glass technologies with the coatings and inner layers and so forth that architects use all the time to try to manage, um, you know, the, how, how to manage daylight, you know, uh, everyone's building glass buildings these days. And so it's a common issue. And there's there's actually a phenomenal amount that uh, glass technology has uh, has been able to do to sort of manage these issues. Um, and so we're aware of it, uh, but we we don't think it's a factor that would justify relocating the space. Because it would be worse on the south side, and and then the the west and north uh, really aren't suitable for other for other reasons. So you did so, a uh, solar analysis of the southern condition. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't think it's publishable. I mean, we did uh, we we uh, but we did have you know we have a calculator. Uh, my colleague uh, Brian ran you know ran it through the calculator to see the sun angles to see how deep into the space it, it penetrated. Also, I think in the new design, we've also created somewhat of an overhang. I yeah. think. Let me let me go back. And um, and, and I know, I mean, so we're this meeting occurs. We're we're a couple. Uh, well, we're you know, we're, we're finalizing schematic design updates. Um, and uh, we've had some encounters with UDC archivists. Uh, th this meeting, we've got um. The AAG's review comments from the concept submission, and uh, which um, uh, sort of made it into the process late because the concept submission, because of the timing of when the concept submission was made available. So some things are 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 um, uh, are all merging together, but we're trying to 
uh, I mean, truth be told, we're we're basically revising uh, the schematic design submission midstream to try to capture as many response actions uh, sure. that 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 we can, and um, we anticipate uh, being ready to submit this revised uh, SD. And, and when I say revised, there never was a first one. Like uh, be before we before we finished schematic design, we actually intercepted ourselves and just started revising it. Um, so you could call it a uh, I don't want to use the word delay because that's a bad word, but we we have um, we've expanded the schematic design phase to to uh, to address these things. And um, let me see, I was trying to get back. Yeah, so I think we've pushed this window wall a couple feet in beyond the drip line of the building, so that might help. No, Scott, I, I would say I fully understand your position. I hope that uh, yeah. it's very clear that so that these are considerations that we're trying to I'm trying to understand as much as I'm trying to. Uh, that there are things that I'm concerned about, but um, and can right. understand your rationale, understand your in process. Um, so I, I think the the entry in particular has improved dramatically, and I have the simplification of the building. So certainly a lot of great things to see here, um, and I, I think I'm good with that line of questioning. Okay, Thank thanks. You. All right, all right, Lopez. I see lots more orange hands on yes, the side the panel here. Hand, so the number one hand is Trudy Peterson. So. Uh, Another AAG member, so uh, can uh, unmute yourself yes. and turn on the camera too. Uh, unless, well, she, she could be temporarily distracted. Uh, uh, I don't she know. might be. So let's switch to um, Caroline Number Petty. Two. She's next in line. Can you see me and hear me? We can. Yes. Okay, thank you, uh, and good good afternoon, everybody. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity, um, and, and thank you uh, both, Dr. Matthews and uh, Mr. Texera, for um, taking time out of your, I know, very busy days to to offer this opportunity both to AAG and to, to the public uh, and stakeholders at large. Very much appreciate it. Um, I guess the uh, I want to I have a question about. Uh, environmental and energy sustainability of the of the building. Um, it seems to me that um, let's see how can I put this without I don't want to sound overly negative at all, but it, it strikes me that the um, interest in sustainability and incorporating sustainability into the design and, and operations of the building is pretty lackluster. And by that, I, I just mean it's not something that's being celebrated in the building, which um, kind of surprises me considering the issues at stake and the uh, severity of the climate crisis that's now upon us, but also considering that um, environmental sustainability has been a very high priority of Mayor Bowser's, um, and not only Mayor Bowser's, but the universities as, as well. They, they pride themselves on being a sustainable campus, and they have a whole office devoted to the subject and so forth. So. I, the, I guess I, I was kind of surprised to, it doesn't seem like there are any real stretch goals associated with this, this project. Um, you know, you're, you're striving for lead gold, um, which relative to a lot of other buildings in the DGS and in, in the city's pipeline, um, we, ha we have other more stringent uh, lead standards that apply including a school in my neighborhood, by the way, one of the first. Um, so I, maybe if you, if you wouldn't mind just commenting on that, uh, maybe certain, tell certain. us yeah. what, what accounts for that. Um, does it have to do with the, the footprint of the building or the nature of archival storage, or does it have to do with costs? So if you could comment on, on all of that, I'd really appreciate it. Certainly, and um, and at some point in my remarks here, uh, Miss Petty, I'll probably invite my colleague uh, Dunstan McCauley with uh, SETI. He's our 
our lead mechanical engineer, because he'll be able to speak uh, a lot more intelligently about some of the sustainability measures that are being integrated into the building's uh, engineering systems and so forth. But, but to begin with, you know, the the starting point really, you know, we we didn't choose uh, as the design team. You know, we we didn't choose um, the sustainability goals. You know, they were given to us by the city. So uh, your your question uh, uh, in in one part uh, is is sort of for them. Like like what why was lead gold sort of identified as the standard? Now I I can tell you that. Um, one of the one of the uh, contributing factors probably to selecting gold uh, is that uh, facilities of this type are are by their very nature um, uh, uh, consume a lot of, of energy, right? And um, and so when you consider sort of the baseline case of an archival facility, uh, just by virtue of the highly specialized environments that it must uh, provide and maintain, um, it can be difficult uh, to to design one that uses sort of less energy than a base case. Um, now, that being said, uh, both uh, Michelle uh, Pacifico and I uh, 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 interact with a lot of other uh, uh, colleagues around the country and around the world that have devoted uh, years in, in the last couple of decades to investigating um, energy savings and sustainability strategies for archival facilities. And uh, a lot of this is accomplished uh, through um, sort of updated thinking, if you will, on what the environmental set points should be on the storage environments and and the extent to which they can uh, fluctuate on a seasonal basis. And so, you know, uh, in in the summertime and in, in the winter time and heating and cooling seasons, you know, we would transition very gradually. Um, so there's no sudden fluctuations. Uh, between a summer set point and a winter set point and and this strategy actually does uh, result in um, a tremendous amount of operational savings in terms of energy consumption um, uh, the other thing too i think philosophically is that uh, it has been made abundantly clear to us anyway that that this that that the priority for this building is the the protection and preservation of the archives Right. And 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 so and that, that's an often that's a common sort of I don't want to say dichotomy or, or or that they're at odds because there's been a lot of research to show that that you can actually achieve both sustainability goals and preservation goals um, uh, uh, through smart design. But um, but, you know, if, if it ever did come down to one versus the other, you, you know, our, our allegiance here is to is to the collection and, and its preservation. And, um, uh, and and then you had also asked about cost, and obviously sustainability measures all come with the complement of, of of cost impact. Um, uh, and uh, but I, I I also would like to learn more about what things you're seeing in the design that that you think don't demonstrate sustainable design. I mean, we're, it's a we're using very uh, uh, durable and long lasting uh, materials. Uh, materials that you know uh, can all be furnished from from uh, relatively local sources. You know we've got uh, you know green roofs for. Uh, 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 I mean, while yes, it's a regulatory requirement, a lot of the stormwater management uh, regulations uh, uh, directly address sustainability goals. Uh, you know we've got plans for the on-site renewable energy um, and a whole host of other things and. I think with that, actually, I've spoken too much. And Dunstan, I don't know if you can add a couple, uh, a couple tidbits that uh, can address uh, Miss Petty's uh, question. <laughs> no, thank you, Scott, and thank you, thank you, Miss Petty, for the question. Yes, it's it's um, you know um, sustainability is a big part of our practice, and we've had uh, several discussions just looking at opportunities to to improve the overall efficiency and uh, and try and add more sustainable features to to the project so for you know like like scott had indicated um an archival facility by itself is energy intensive so we've looked at different systems like we've looked at some passive systems um for for their archival sp uh, storage spaces that are uh, that will will use a lot less energy than the typical 
active desiccant systems that you typically see in these spaces. So those are some of the measures that we're looking at. Um, we're looking at opportunities to do some heat recovery and 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 reuse reuse that heat for for heating purposes as opposed to generating um, 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 energy on site. Um, we are looking at um, at trying to you know with the district's uh, emissions goal, looking at um, of 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 um, net zero carbon by 2045. We are looking at an all electric building as opposed to utilizing fossil fuels or, 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 or other sources. Um, and as Scott alluded, a lot of it is um, the gradual changes from season to season. Um, operating the building, looking at some of those strategies to operate the building can have significant energy savings. So those are some of the, the high level goals we're looking at, even for the the more public spaces and office spaces. Um, um, the systems that we're looking at, um, typically when I've used them in 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 office type environments, uh, will 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 yield anywhere from about 20 to 25 percent savings over your typical um, your systems that are, are 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 out there. We haven't run the energy calculations on on this model yet, but we are we are looking at those opportunities. You know, nothing. It's not one large nugget that we're going to find just because the building is so energy uh, uh, intensive. It's it's looking at ways of optimizing various components of the design and of the system of the building so that the overall uh, a reduction in energy can 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 will can be significant. So that's that's how we are approaching it. Um, with with the mindset that the the function of the spaces is critical. So we want to make sure we maintain that and then find ways how we can optimize the systems and the system selections so that we 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 are um we are providing a very sustainable energy efficient building. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. It does. Thank thank you very much for all that information and and for extending the invitation to maybe get back to you with some more specific nuggets of ideas. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Yeah, and, and real quick, uh, uh, Lopez, before we turn it over to the next uh, question, um, I, I just want to say one thing about Lead Gold, right? It's not, I just want everyone here to understand that the design team isn't approaching the design of this project like, oh, all we got to do is get to the gold threshold, right? We're basically trying to make this building as sustainable as we possibly can. Uh, I think the last time I looked at our lead scorecard, we were only a couple, you know, lead credits away from from the platinum level, so it, it's within range. Um, and and you know, there's goals versus obligations, right? So I think everyone understands that the designers of this project were were contractually obligated to achieve gold, but we're not prohibited from doing better than that, right? Um, I mean, there is a budget to manage, and and that's a reality that every project must face. But we're looking for every single opportunity we can uh, to to introduce uh, sustainable features into this uh, into this project. So I just wanted to make sure we just weren't focused on gold and that was it. That's not the way that we're thinking about the project. <clears throat> Good point. Thank you. So I'm going to swing back to Trudy, but she put her comment in the, in the chat. chat. Yeah, so I guess she's not able to unmute. So she says, how will the architecture protect the above ground structure from the gases and other elements in the garage levels? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's a question that she actually uh, um, made previously, but um, uh, we're doing it. Uh, well, there, there's a few things there. One is we're, we're asking the structural engineer and all the engineers to basically uh, do better than the minimum code requirement. Uh, so I, I, I think like the code says that the fire resistance level of, of construction between these types of uses should be two or three hours. And, and we're basically asking that the uh, building's uh, bottom level be designed with a, a separation, a excuse me, a construction separation that's one hour better than the minimum requirement. Um, in terms of gases and air infiltration, I think we're managing that Dunstan with pressurization uh, keeping the building positively pressurized and making sure that the 
garage is uh, always negative relative uh, to the pressurized uh, building. Um, are that, there any other? Yeah. That is correct. And also, um, you know, two of the biggest components of exhaust are carbon monoxide and nitrogen uh, monoxide as well. So um, one way to monitor, we, we will have sensors throughout the garage, which will monitor those levels. And then as those levels start to increase, as you get more traffic, they will, they will ramp up the fans to make sure that they, the, the garage stays negative in respect to the building. And that's how, from a mechanical perspective, in addition to what's being done architecturally and structurally, uh, mechanically, we're going to keep that negative by monitoring gases and then increasing our exhaust when they do start to ramp up. Yeah, and actually, I want to point that out because the garage, as originally designed, is a naturally ventilated garage. It was not uh, a mechanically ventilated garage, but I, uh, what uh, what Dunstan is referring to is that we're going to supplement uh, the garage's ventilation with mechanically assisted uh, uh, fans, uh, ventilation systems. Um, so that they can operate to uh, when needed based on these sensors um, to uh, promote even you know, enhanced ventilation. I don't know what the right word is, but um, basically to augment uh, the uh, the ventilation of the garage with by mechanical means. So. <clears throat> Thank you so much. So our next person is Jean. Jean is back. You should be able to turn on your mic. And camera, Gene. There you are. So you're still muted, though. Is it possible? We might be able to unmute her. You from know, here. You, there's a button on Zoom that lets you un ask people to unmute, but I don't see it on Teams. Uh, and so she's talking, more. but we can't hear. Because she has the ability to turn on her mic. OK, so she says, I live across Connecticut Avenue at Van Ness North. Who I face UDC and C Building 41 currently. I have had persistent issues with UDC having intrusive exterior lighting that shines into my windows. What is the plan for both construction and permanent lighting? Also, buildings which have 24-7 HVAC running. The neighborhood is hilly and sounds travel. Have you thought of ways to minimize the HVAC roar throughout the area? Wow. Okay. These are two uh, very good questions, and we actually have not heard these before, although I have heard them before. Uh, we've done other work for the city with uh, schools, and uh, I was part of the team that worked on the Lafayette Elementary School, and, and the uh, night lighting was uh, a really big concern of the neighborhood there uh, with the you know school grounds and lights bl blaring into neighbors' uh, windows. Um, uh, I, I actually I, I can't say now what what we've what we've um, what we're already doing um, uh, to manage uh, lighting. I mean, I know there's um, a night lighting coalition or a night lighting guideline for dark skies um, that is out there. Um, and uh, so I'll encourage our team to uh, reference that. And uh, we do have a professional lighting consultant on this team, MCLA, who are. Uh, well versed in lighting technologies and lighting uh, techniques for managing um, the direction of of lighting and illumination. Uh, this is a common concern, and so I think uh, they'll they'll be uh, well equipped uh, to uh, factor these concerns uh, into our developing design uh, once we start focusing on lighting design. Um, so. Uh, uh, Thank you for the question, and I, I guess at the next meeting we might be able to share things that we're doing to address it. And if we could, I just wanted to acknowledge that you know noted, uh, uh, we'll we'll be mindful of that. Uh, noise concerns. Um, uh, we do have some exterior equipment. Uh, I know it's. I've told the mechanical engineers to select equipment with acoustic shrouds and with noise power data that is as favorable as possible for reducing. Uh, noise. Um, we are early in the design. I know the city has noise regulations that will obviously be complying with those in terms of the decibel levels during certain hours of the day as measured from the property line. Um, um, I think maybe some of the noises that you hear, I don't know if they're all associated with Building 41 or with other facilities on the campus, other facilities. All right. Well, 
So I think the reality is we're not going to be able to address all of your concerns because uh, we're only working on this one building, which is uh, just one part of a large complex. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, the only commitment I can make now is that we'll we'll do every everything we can responsibly to manage uh, uh, noise and acoustics externally uh, as we design our project. And I'll be able to report more specifics as we get deeper into design. But yeah, really, the engineers are just waiting for the architects here to finish, you know, <laughs> finish finish the the massing and the floor plans and stuff before they begin. And the 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 real technical work is about to begin, I think, starting here in a couple months. So. Oh, Lopez, now you're muted. muted. Yeah. Let's <laughs> see. <laughs> we hadn't actually heard that question before, so thank you for that. We wrote that down. I, well, I wrote that down to make sure yeah. to keep it on my list of things to think about. Um, I don't see any other hands, but in the chat we have... Yeah, um, some people are using well, the chat. I Unfortunately, we have to use Teams with DC government, so that's why right. we can't use Zoom. Got to follow regulations, keep your job. <laughs> so, so I still see, I, uh, Lopez, but, um, I still see two hands well, up. I see Trudy's hand Trudy is up and Jean's hand is still up. Um, but Caroline did add in the chat, um, glad you'll be looking into night sky illumination guidelines. How about other bird-friendly designs? Have you considered other bird-friendly designs? Uh, uh, well, I mean, yeah, yes and no, not yet. I mean, um, the, the architects here at Hartman Cox are, are well aware of, of the, um, uh, the issue of bird strikes and buildings that have glaze systems and all the techniques that have been, um, identified, uh, by the advocates of, 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 uh, bird control for sort of humane ways to, um, apply, uh, fritz and other patterns and features to glazing systems so that the birds can understand that there's glass there and uh to you know reduce bird strikes and uh we certainly intend to incorporate um those measures in the selection of our window wall systems and our current wall systems um there's lots of different strategies i don't know if i can say yet which one we'll we'll, we'll use but but we are aware of the concern and intend to address it in our design okay. Thank you, uh, Scott. And next we have Charles Hendricks. Mr. Hendricks. So, so I'd just like to ask uh, about the timeline. Uh, what uh, is the uh, time estimated uh, time that will be required for the completion of the design and for the construction? Okay, so uh, uh, we have been asked by uh, DGS to have the designs uh, completed by the uh, spring of next year. Um, and uh, and my understanding is that uh, construction is planned uh, to begin shortly after. So in the, you know, spring to summer time frame, uh, there's uh, where uh, the city I know is uh, uh, embarking upon uh, the solicitations for a construction manager for this project. And once that has happened and that entity is sort of on board and selected, um, which would be later this year is my understanding uh, in the you know late summer, I think, um, uh, a, a lot of the specifics about how the projects can be delivered from the construction standpoint, like whether it would be done through one contract or through a, a series of sort of early release contracts for, cause there's some things you can do on a building that you can, you can start demolition first and then do like your uh, foundations to grade as a second thing. So there's, there's lots of sort of fast tracking strategies that projects sometimes deploy to, um, to try to eke out uh, so, some time savings and so forth. Um, and and that range of options I, I i i know are all being considered but i don't think there's anything definite that's been concluded uh we do know that we're aiming to to have the building uh done um by uh the summer of um 2026 uh you know done and occupied by then um but the exact sort of construction duration i think is sort of pending further analysis by the um, as of yet, not selected a construction managing uh, firm, construction manager uh, firm. Um, 
And and so we've just been asked to make sure that we can complete designs uh, at a point in time, again, you know, by next spring or so, um, to give uh, DGS uh, uh, optimum flexibility about the construction uh, uh, implementation. But I, I, I don't, I'm not aware that anything specific has been said. I don't know. I've got some colleagues. Um, there are other project representatives from DGS that I think are here that that might be able to to speak to that better than I can. But um, good but afternoon, that's what Mr. I. Hendricks. This is Muhammad Jalla with DGS. I'm the executive program manager that manages the municipal's portfolio for DGS. Just to answer your question, short and sweet, uh, Scott is absolutely correct. We are looking at a summer turnover of F uh, 2026. Um, he's absolutely correct in reference to just the details will be flushed out once we have a general contract on board. So currently everything is a TBD. And and will that whole section of the campus be blocked off? Will there be access to Van Ness Street uh, past the construction area while construction is in progress? Yes, we, we don't have any intentions on blocking off any roadway access on Van Ness throughout the duration of the construction for the project. Of course, there will be temporary shutdowns of Van Ness during crane picks, which we'll get permits for. In reference to any sidewalk blockage, it is too early to tell right now. Typically, when we bring a general contract on board, we put together a logistics plan, and that logistics plan is fraternized with the UDC. And then we'll come together to figure out exactly what works, regardless if there are any sidewalk close downs or sidewalk shutdowns. There will be alternative pathways to funnel people in and out of the campus and through Van Ness Street. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Caroline, you're back. Uh, I figured if, if you don't mind, I would come back if I'm not taking somebody else's time. No, you, you're, you're here and then Neil is next. Okay. Um, yeah, so a um, couple of uh, minor questions. What, one was on the, um, the multi-purpose room, which looks like a, a meeting room that can be subdivided into a larger or smaller. What's the occupancy max on, on that room? Do you know? Oh my gosh! Uh, yeah, I feel like I'm being. I, I, it's a uh, 300 is the uh, maximum when arranged with all the subdividing partitions uh, open, uh, so see. that it functions as one large space. Uh, we've been asked uh, to um, design it to accommodate 300, and I, I, I think that's what we have. I mean, uh, okay. in the program in the programmatic phase, we had done like test fits and use cases with you know, seating and chair arrangements and so forth. And uh, so in, in one of the particular setups, yeah, the 300 guests uh, listening to a speaker uh, is is uh, the intent of that, is the objective of that space in terms of its capacity, yeah. Okay, good. Um, and then um, the we're, we've been aware um, that um, there is um, work underway I think Dr. Matthews has been involved in others work underway to um, work with the University of the District of Columbia on ironing out kind of MOU type details for um, accessing the site and beginning work. And it would address the, the myriad um, issues and details associated with developing this facility on the campus. Um, and I guess my question is, um, it, are there things about that MOU process are, or, 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 and the issues involved in it that are stymieing progress on, you know, the design work associated with the building or any of the work that um, Hartman Cox is, is, is doing? Or are, or are those two separate things? Yeah, L Lopez, I got this if yeah. you want. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Uh, the uh, at, at it, it seemed as if that might have been possible a couple months ago, um, as uh, as we were learning more about uh, those those ongoing negotiations and sort of 
analyzing that against the schedule for getting zoning and permit approvals and so forth. But um, but the university uh, granted uh, the project a uh, letter of consent um, for uh, um, undertaking uh, all of the necessary uh, zoning notifications and so forth. Uh, it's all conditional. You know, the university uh, obviously um, is still working through with um, with uh, Dr. Matthews and the mayor's office and and so forth on on the nuances of their you know operating you know division of responsibilities in terms of that operating agreement. Uh, but in terms of the impact on designing the project, that that was decoupled a while ago. Uh, we 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 uh, uh, we um, uh, in fact. Uh, I think uh, the zoning attorneys intend to submit the the first um, the, the the very first uh, action for for zoning approval, which is a called a notice of intent. It's just to tell the zoning commission that that we intend to apply for a, a, a zoning um, action uh, in 45 days or so. So that that I think will be uh, filed as early as next week and. Um, and synchronizes nicely with the project's overall schedule uh, for getting permits and time to start construction and time to deliver a building by the summer of 2026. So, yeah. Thank you. Good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next, uh, Neo. Great. So I'll just I'm, I'm thank you for letting me go again. Um, the I have one really really concrete question then a little bit more one that requires a more elaboration so the first one is uh, just uh, when would the drawings be uh, posted uh, online or available uh, to, to further study um, and then um, the, the second question is um, can you talk a little bit about the rooftop reconfiguration you did um, I think it's a it seems like a very sensible idea I'm glad it worked out um, so can you explain what what units are still on top of um, the the roof, and then which ones were moved to the to the uh, west side of the building, and and then the, yeah. the stair how the stair tower affects composition and stuff like that. So I am going to do this with you, Neil, um, because let me. Um, I love drawings. Let's do it. Uh, let's see. Uh, how do I get out of page display? Rotate. Can, Can I just get out? No, I want to get out of full screen mode. Oh, go back. There we go. Oh. Okay. Well, it worked. All right. So, um, all right, Dunstan, you're still on the line. So we got the DOAS units. This, for those that don't know, this is dedicated outside air. What's the S stand for? System? System, yes. Yeah, all right. And um, and actually, these drawings were from when we had two. I, I think the latest thinking is to uh, use a a fan array system uh, and have a single DOAS. So that's up on this uppermost roof. Uh, what are DESs? The desiccant system. So we're going to have yep. basically air handling equipment on the air handling equipment on the roof. So that way, they they tend to be quieter. We, we're not going to have compressorized. You, you know, if we if we can avoid it, we're going to try and avoid compressorized equipment on the roof. Um, and then looking to move. Uh, the uh, the chillers and the generators to the lower roof so that they were somewhat shielded a bit uh, to help with some of the acoustical treatment. We are going to look at, um, again, as Scott had said earlier, uh, the district does have uh, acoustical requirements and we're going to we're going to meet or exceed those requirements. Um, um and and look at ways to to attenuate some of the the sound coming off that equipment so that's that's the plan for now in the conceptual schematic design as we start to lay them out you know we'll see how we can optimize the layouts yeah the, the other thing neil is um this lower roof where the noisier equipment are the generators and the chillers um, we have uh, increased the height of this parapet, so now I think it's like 12 feet high. So it's so actually the facade is acting as a screen wall, but it's solid. Uh, the idea there is that uh, you know sound energy coming from this equipment would be redirected upward and uh, buffering it from from traveling you know laterally. Um, there's also opportunities there to incorporate uh, additional sound absorption systems, exterior rated sound absorption systems there. 
uh, depending on what we may or may not be able to accomplish with equipment shrouds and so forth. But um, uh, yeah, so the air handling uh, uh, elements are up on the upper roof, and then uh, and then we've got our emergency power equipment and our uh, chillers up up on this roof. No, thank you for explaining that. Um, I, I think the designated system you're descri describing is, is very interesting and it sounds very promising in terms of uh, sustainability benefits. I, I wasn't aware of that. So it's a big improvement. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm, a, I'm a little would be interested in seeing a little more detail on the on the shading effects of having any screen equipment up there. I'm kind of curious uh, why the why you would keep him keep the DOS outside. I mean, you can certainly put a DOS inside an enclosure. So I'm just curious what your uh, which maybe would work help for help uh, protecting penetrations and other things like that. Um, and and we'll look at both. Um, the, it, you know, from a cost perspective, um, you know, now you have to build an enclosure, um, and and so forth. Whereas the the minimal upgrade in the equipment enclosure to go from an interior piece of equipment to a outdoor weatherproof in, a, a, a equipment is is minimal so just looking at at opportunities to to um reduce some costs without uh, uh impacting the function of the of, of, of the uh um, storage facility so that that was one of the reasons that we're looking at outdoor type equipment, you know. Um, but again, it, the the we as we'll, we'll analyze that and and as we continue to go forward and and see what's um, you know right. ways we can improve um, the system design. Well, and, and when it, when it comes, I'm sorry, Neil, if I could, because when it comes to cost, though, one of the things you know in these types of settings, sometimes people can latch on to a, a belief that 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 you know, something's being cost driven or that there's some aspect of the design that's sort of suffering because of its cost and so forth. And that's that I don't believe is the case here, because what we're talking about here really is like what like what's the what's the best way uh, you know, to use the budget for this project. And so yeah. if we if we were to specify interior equipment, then, yes, we have to invest in a fully enclosed rooftop structure uh, of a certain height, additional roof system and so forth. And um and and so is is all of that added capital cost really offset by the incremental advantage of I guess it'd be the additional lifespan of an indoor equipment versus outdoor equipment or so forth, and then you compare that with with okay uh, uh, outdoor equipment with its with its uh, cases and and types of construction that are galvanized stainless steel whatever, um, uh, and so it's a cost benefit analysis and and really what we're striving to do here is to not impede performance at all right maximize performance uh but with the most responsible use of 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 budget right so that's i don't want to call it a game but that's 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 what we do that's what architects and engineers do as as you know so um that, so anyway i just wanted to throw that in there when it comes to cost as it relates to these decisions so no, Scott, and it's it's a, a very well said, and I'm glad you you mentioned that. So I, I think that's uh, the only thing I have on on the roof. I would say in terms of the, uh, I also want to say that it's, it's great to see the simplification of the of the the the, the massing. Um, I, I think that the the concept that you articulated of the of the sort of flowing panels is becoming a bit more clear, and I look forward to seeing uh, more about that in the um, as you develop the facade treatment itself. Um, yeah. Which so. Yeah, my colleague, uh, the the um, the project architect for this project, who would have been here presenting, but he's on vacation with his family. But he he uh, is eager for us to start developing, uh, you know, higher quality rendering so people can really, you know, get a sense of of how this building is going to look. Um, everything we've done so far is, so, so far is using um, uh, I don't want to say less capable, but 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 simpler, you know, rendering software like SketchUp and so forth. But but um, and then, yeah, as design progresses, we're hoping to make additional improvements. Are there any other uh, comments? I think I saw something in the chat. We, Lopez have, about two, uh, we have three more comments in the chat. Um, Kim Bender asked about, um, have you all investigated the potential requirements you may face under the Greener Government Buildings Amendment Act that passed last year? I think you <laughs> may have referenced it. I guess I, I, I'm in the disadvantageous position of having to 
concede I don't uh, I'm not familiar with the provisions of that act. I don't know, uh, Dunstan, if you or your team has uh, uh, anything yes. to comment. Yeah, we we are we are looking at um, some of the provisions of that act and trying to uh, incorporate them in the design um, um, and so forth. So. Um, not we're not just looking at what's current, but again, where what are some of the uh, goals of the district um, and how how we can incorporate right. those goals in this current design. This project is going to it's going to be around for another 20 years, so we want to be um, as um, we we want to be forward thinking in 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 our system so that we are meeting. Um, the goals that we know are coming that have been approved right. and so forth. Is is this the law that uh, discusses like the all electric um, and mm -hmm. and you know electric vehicle uh, provisions and all those other sort of things? Because uh, so I think we have been talking about this and and um, <laughs> and there was some back and forth. I think there was a draft of the act and then what actually got passed was different and and so forth. But uh, we've had a couple working sessions internally about about the goals of this law and 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 what we can do to be sort of ahead of the curve um so uh, i don't know the specifics because but um but we can be better prepared to discuss the specifics at the next meeting it requires buildings to comply with net zero energy standards and 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 we are meeting a lot of well you know for example um most well, it's going to target net zero. No one um, there. There are very few adopted net zero standards that are currently out on the market. Uh, so we we are looking at, you know, the opportunity. So you know, for we are planning for solar. We are looking at how the buildings designed to as efficiently as possible, uh, so that reduces the burden of uh, purchase renewables and so forth. So. We we are incorporating aspects of it. It's it's informing the design. Um, it's it's not the primary driver of the design. As I said, we're looking at some of the emissions requirements and making sure that we address those um, and so forth. So we have two more comments, and then someone raised their hand. So Ida Jones says, "I love the design and the location." There's access for the metro community as well as cross fertilization with the UDC higher education community in the general Northwest corridor. And Trudy Peterson asked, how did we come up with the $30 million figure to be added to the 73 million for construction? What went into that calculation? And I don't know. If you're prepared to uh, talk about that, if you yeah. want, we can move on. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'll say the number was determined by DGS, but uh, there there were a lot of um, well, not a lot, but uh, uh, the the our team uh, does have a cost consultant who has uh, been contributing some cost analysis uh, to the updated program and to the concept design, and so uh, there there was some uh, cost guidance or cost you know information uh, coming out of our team that I know was shared uh, with DGS as they worked uh, internally and with the mayor's office and so forth to uh, determine a number. Um, so I, I, I have to assume that it's in some measure uh, um, uh, been built upon some uh, recommendations that came came out of my team. Um, but I, I don't know exactly how the number was determined. Uh, and again, Mo, I invite either you or uh, Wayne or someone else to maybe uh, affirm what I've just said or to uh, add to it. Wayne has come off mute. Yeah, I came off mute. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you guys for having us here. I'm Wayne Gore with DGS External Affairs. And to go off of what Scott was saying, we will certainly look into how we came up with that calculation and we'll report back to you all when we have additional information. Thank you so much, Wayne. And uh, we have Cheryl Hawkins next. Uh, good afternoon. 
thank you mm -hmm. for having this session. This is very informative. Um, I work at the university and with the cable TV station. Uh, I am a jazz lover and I am really happy to see that the, these, uh, the Philly C. Grant Jazz Archives will be included in this uh, new structure. And um, there are some specificities about the jazz archives that I think uh, will need to be taken into consideration as you move along. But I have a question about um, demolition of Building 41. What is that process? And, and of course, you all know it sits on top of the garage there. How do you uh, demolish a building like that? And what effect will it have on the rest of the campus as you go on through that process? Right. Yeah. Well, the first answer is very carefully. Uh, but uh, no, but uh, to be serious, um, it is it is not an ordinary uh, uh, demolition, uh, uh, certainly. Um, uh, I would characterize the building's demolition to be some uh, um, um, as, as like deconstruction, right? Or it, essentially it's going to be picked apart um, okay. uh, is what I would anticipate. I mean, obviously the initial uh, stages of demolition will be the environmental you know remediation the building is of a vintage that it it, it does uh, have uh, you know lead containing paints and asbestos and some other some other things that any building of this age has so uh, the first people to go in would be the environmental contractors to abate and uh, remediate all of those materials uh, you know the internal construction systems partitions doors you know every everything that can be uh, you know knocked down and carried out will be taken out until the building is probably just a shell. Uh, and then I would presume it's uh, window systems and so forth would be extracted. And then uh, it's uh, facades, the precast panels would be uh, uh, disassembled and picked, you know, carried down one at a time by a crane just in the reverse of constructing a building of this type. Uh, but um, during this time, we are anticipating that the uh, garage level directly beneath the uh, building 41 would be closed uh, to, you know, it would be taken out of service just as a safety precaution. Um, and um, uh, again, pending further analysis by the construction contractor, uh, we uh, have been suggesting that it may be appropriate that that the um, the concrete structure that separates the level B parking from the level B1 parking, uh, you know, is adequate, you know, protection uh, and that maybe those parking areas uh, could could remain open. Um, but obviously your colleagues at the university's administration are very interested in these same questions um, and and uh, uh, and the specifics uh, will be, you know, uh, as, as more information is known, we'll be able to give better information uh, to your sort of capital projects, the folks at at, at um, uh, within UDC uh, about this, uh, there there are some new foundations that need to be installed. Again, you know, this building is needs to be a lot stronger than Building 41 was. The structural engineers have, is, have been evaluating every column, every footing, and and so we we already know where we're going to need to open up the bottom level to install. Uh, larger uh, uh, footings and foundations. And um, so there will be areas of the lowest level that will be um, closed uh, to execute those uh, construction activities. Those would be somewhat more localized, you know, uh, but, um, and and so it will probably change over time. Like, I think there will be certain areas that are out of uh, closed uh, for use uh, for certain periods of time and then reopened and then other areas that will be closed and reopened. So it's not like a once and done thing. It's not a simple answer to your question. So I think there's going to be a variety of shorter term closures in certain areas that collectively uh, would add up to a sustained sort of series of of of, of closures or, or temporary closures. Um, uh, we do think, though, that once the uh, plaza level reconstruction is complete uh, uh, in the first probably third of the construction effort as the building is being framed, because um, uh, that the garage area could be turned over and reopened again. You know, so so, you know, the 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 first sort of third of a project is building the 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 frame of the building and then you close it in and then you build all the interiors right so uh, as we're building the frame of the building we start from the bottom up and once we get to that plaza level and get all that decked over uh 
um, you know, the, the lower level should be able to be reoccupied. So it won't be for the whole life of the project. And, and I mm-hmm. think I don't, uh, you know, I, I'm always advised to never give any specifics in a meeting like this, uh, like this, because things can always change. But I think it's reasonable to assume that it'd be about a year, plus or minus, it'd be approximately a year when the garage would be disruptive, disrupted in the pro- in the area of the project in one way or another. So. But, that, but that's just reality. Yeah, I can't change reality. You know, we, we have to build a very big building on top of a garage and it's not going to be easy. Yeah. And when you hear demolition, you think of imploding. And I'm like, I know that's not going to no, happen. No, so- <laughs> no, no. There's going to be no wrecking balls. None of that. <laughs> All yeah. right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, uh, just in case you all missed it in the chat, Caroline Petty put information about the Archives Advisory Group for the D.C. Council. So if you are interested, she put their email and their Twitter handle. So uh, check them out. So any other questions or comments or thoughts? Charles Hendricks did say he seconded Ida Jones' comment in the chat. This will be a wonderful facility for people studying the history of the District of Columbia. And I agree. (laughs) I agree too. I try not to get emotionally attached to these projects, but uh, one fifth of my life has been devoted to this project. And so uh, I'm not going to give up until there are happy researchers in there um, <laughs> soak, soaking up the district's history. So Exactly. So I see, uh, oh, well, she disappeared. I said, see Secretary Batson is back. So welcome back, Secretary Batson. Oh, well, I guess before, because Secretary Batson may close us out. So uh, Mr. Hendricks, did you want to say something before Secretary Batson closed us out? Okay, so Secretary Bassett, the floor is yours. And you're muted. Again, Scott, that was an awesome presentation. Um, Thank you, Dr. Lopez. Thank you for all our participants. Um, It's really exciting that everybody's excited about this um, archives. Again, as I said, this is very important to Mayor Bowser, important to um, her administration, important to us. We want to make this right. Um, It's going to be a beautiful partnership with UDC, and um, we think that we're going to really, really get a lot of students interested in the archives, hopefully. So again, thank you so much. Thank you to um, the advisory group for being on the call. Thank you for your continued advice and support. And um, Dr. Lopez, I'll let you end it officially. All righty. Well, I guess I just want to uh, thank everybody for coming out. Thank everyone for their support. Um, In case you all did not know, this is my one year anniversary as the new state archivist for DC. So I am still excited, still happy to be here and still excited to be working to uh, support the history of the District of Columbia. You know, it's important work. um, It's exciting work and I'm happy to see where we go from here. So I'm happy and I'm excited. So I hope everyone else is excited as well. Now. Katharina Herring from the Friends of the Archives raised her hand and then put it back down. So I guess we will uh, end there. And thank you for the comment about um, thanking me for a happy anniversary. I'm excited to be here. And so have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you, everybody. And thanks to Solomon Ikatan, our great project manager from DGS, who is here as well. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. How many more to come? That's right. (laughs) Yes. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.